Hi everyone and welcome to the talk Bayesian Inferential Risk Evaluation on Multiple Information Retrieval Systems. I'm your speaker Roger Benham and this paper is also co-authored with Ben Carter from Spotify and my two supervisors Shane and Alistair. So in statistical inference we think about how can we make inferences based on what is observable over the entire universe of values based on what we can adequately sample. So we have to the left here, we've got this sample, we're sampling from the population distribution, and we have this representative sample of what we know about, say, for instance, information retrieval scores. So in an information retrieval score, we've got combinations of system and topic effects, which forms an effectiveness score. And what we typically use is a student t-test in, in IR at the moment. However, there's been other tests that have been proposed, like the random permutation tests and bootstrap and so on that are non-parametric that don't have the amount of assumptions that the student t-test has. However, we know that in information retrieval scores, typically they are robust to these kinds of uh, violations and assumptions, which is, which is good. And however, we know with, with these scores that they're basing it on this hypothetical population distribution where you could have a system that is really terrible or a system that doesn't even exist yet uh, with, with these hypothetical resampling methods and, and replicate scores. So what if we were able to form inferences based on what we actually know about information retrieval scores? And these, these systems, luckily enough, are submitted to TREC and NTCIR, which practitioners have access to. So we want to know what happens when we use those scores to form, form inferences. So research question one is, how does using previous system artifacts, so we're going to call those systems artifacts, how does that affect the Bayesian inferential results for IR test collections? The next part of this title is risk. So risk has many different overloaded connotations in IR, but for, for now, let's talk about risk as in U-risk, which was proposed by Wang et al. as a learning to rank function, learning to rank objective function, uh, where you've got this, uh, where you've got a experimental system being compared against a baseline system. So you take the sum of the score differences per topic that were wins, and think of this like an aggregate function like the mean, and then you subtract the sum of the score differences that are losses. However, different to the arithmetic mean, we have this R value, which scales up the impact of those losses. And that's meant to reflect a different such as risk aversion. And studies in economics know that humans are typically risk averse, right? Uh, a gain of $100 hurts twice as much if you lose that $100. So why is this interesting from a statistical perspective? So previous work such as taking risk of confidence, which we worked on last year at ADCS, we, we showed different risk values on, and this is the best submitted run to Robusto 4 versus BN25. And when the risk value is the same, sure, they, they all agree with each other. However, when you increase the risk value, the distributions get more asymmetric and the assumptions that were made on the t-test no longer apply anymore. It needs to be corrected for this bias due to the asymmetry of the distribution. So how does that tie into Bayesian inference? So in Bayesian inference, we have prior which is a mathematical object that we ascribe this understanding of what we think or what previous studies have said, what the, the shape of the, the distribution should look like. And then we combine that with the likelihood. And the likelihood is the, the observations that we have observed. So think of that of the, the frequent test tests before, um, think that's, that's your likelihood. And then we combine them together and we get this posterior distribution, which is known as the complete inference. And that's what we form our credible intervals on. So a prior is the most controversial aspect of Bayesian inference. Uh, so it can be formed from previous studies and that's known as a informative prior. 
Uh, but typically what's done is we use a weekly informative prior where the parameters are so vague that we know something about it. So we, we say that, okay, this, this score distribution looks like it might be Gaussian, so let's say it's Gaussian. And so the Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation uh, updates the parameters in this week, weekly informative prior to, to push it towards a more credible value for which we would then perform inference on. Of interest is to compare this skewed normal distribution, which takes three parameters. It's got a mean, it's got a variance, and it's got this skewedness parameter. And we want to compare that with the Gaussian distribution on risk-adjusted score differences to see if we can get tighter intervals based on mean. Because the mean ultimately determines which system is different or not in, in our tests. So research question two is how does the Bayesian prior affect inferential results using risk-adjusted scores for one-to-one -one comparisons and one-to-many. And then finally, the third research question is, using the other risk measures in the literature, which I'll discuss later on, how does our approach compare against them for discriminative uh, inferential differences and just how, how, difference, how much different is it? So how do Bayesian and frequentist credible and confidence intervals differ when performing risk-adjusted evaluation? Credible interval is a Bayesian interval, and a confidence interval comes from a frequentist test. So in the approach that we use in our paper, let's talk about Bayesian hierarchical modeling. So hierarchical modeling is a part of the Bayesian sort of toolkit where you take, where, where it's, it's not assumed that everything comes from the same distribution. So something can be attributed to this is a global overall system effect, but then there are down the hierarchy per system effects that, and they're the system effects that we want to be deciding this system is better than the other system and vice versa. Um, so, and, and the prominent statistician, Andrew Gelman, has suggested we don't usually have to compare for these multiple, we don't have to correct for these multiple comparisons because of two reasons. One, we are looking only at score observations that we know and care about, and we're not comparing against the total population. And secondly, this partial pooling approach takes away some of the, the risk of the false positive rate. Um, I'm basing this explanation of Bayesian hierarchical modeling on this Mike Dietz talk. Uh, check out that link if you would like to know more. So in information retrieval, we assume that these scores are independent and identically distributed, and that's how it works for the frequentist tests. However, what if we presume that that's not the case and we say that system scores are governed by some kind of physics for what a system score should be, right? So it should be based on recall, it should be based on precision, and, and, and sometimes some topics are just hard to get scores on and so on. So... Uh, if we put it all together and ascribe it based on like there's one giant system distribution and scores are being pulled from that, well, okay, cool, but we're not going to be able to ascertain which system is better using this approach because we need to be deciding which system is better based on the model parameters, not the score observations in the Bayesian way. So what we do is we can combine this this global system mean with the system score interactions, and this is called partial pooling. And we know that system in system topic interactions forming effectiveness metrics are not strictly governed by a system. It's typically dominated by the topic effect. So some topics are easier to get good scores on and, and harder on others. So if we combine that in our model and we propagate error up into this error term where we where we exclude corpus effects and, and system topic interactions, uh, we can we can form this into the, the error term, and then we can include these artifact systems into this system approach, and then get even cleaner systems inferences based on what is known about other systems. So other risk measures are we've got U risk, which is a descriptive measure, T risk by Dinsha et al described an approach to studentize those U-risk measures so that you didn't need this whole big sample of other systems to compare against. You could just use the inferential way of, is this statistically significantly risky or not? But the issue that Dinsha et al 
looked at was that when you've got this one to many different systems scenario, there's this bias towards the original ranker. So to correct for that, they form this score normalization approach with a matrix of system and topic approaches. And then they, those system scores get transformed into a Z score, which is then applied a, a risk value. And then the geometric mean of the system effectiveness and the Z risk score is combined to form geo risk. That approach doesn't allow for inferential comparisons, however. So our approach allows for one to many for inferential comparisons, and it also combines uh, the nice properties of Bayesian inference as well. So to recap on the research questions, how does using previous system artifacts affect Bayesian inferential results for IR test collections? How does the Bayesian prior affect inferential results using risk-adjusted scores for one-to-one -one comparisons and one-to-many? And finally, how does the Bayesian frequentist credible and confidence intervals differ when performing risk-adjusted evaluation? So here's our approach. We have five different systems, three of which in challenges one to three were selected from the rigor reproducibility track. And then we have challenger four, which is this manufactured run based on the top three systems that were submitted to each respective Trek track of Robusto for Trek Core 2017 and Trek Core 2018. And we use reciprocal rank fusion or comsum depending on the, the track. And we've got this really highly effective run, which we want to be able to declare that that run is better than the BM25 run. Otherwise, our approach isn't very good at determining which one is better or not. And so just a recap of the approach, we've got this champion, we've got these set of challenges, and we're including all of these different artifact systems in this homogenous pool to form natural score inferences on. So on this horizontal axis here, we, we increase the amount of systems that are included in the artifact pool from best system to worst based on the average precision measure. And then on the estimate on the y-axis, a uh, value of zero is the mean system effect. So challenger four is better than average from all of the other systems, thankfully. Um, but in the first instance, they're barely, they're kind of overlapping, right? When you've only got one artifact system to, to draw upon of your background knowledge for what system scores can do. So as we include more systems in this pool, we get more discrimination. However, that discrimination is not always monotonically increasing, which was somewhat surprising, but a testament to the quality of systems that were submitted to Robusto 4. In Trek 17 and Trek 18, you get an approach that's more similar to this. So that's our first research question addressed. And then in the second research question, we're looking at Bayesian priors, right? So in the one-to-one -one comparison, we're comparing this best submitted run to the Trek, of, to the Trek Robusto 4 track, and then comparing that against BM25. And then we're comparing a Gaussian prior with a skewed normal prior. As we'd expect, when the risk value doesn't change, they both agree with each other. However, as we increase this risk value, they tend to disagree with each other and they're shifting to the right, which was in line with what we saw with the previous confidence intervals with the bias corrected approaches. But also we get a tighter credible interval around the density of the location parameter for the skew normal. So this is, this is nice, right? This is what we want because then we can make more discriminative choices between system A is less risky than system B and so on. And the win really doesn't come in this one-to-many Bayesian risk approach because all of these different systems in that hierarchy that we looked at before need to be formed using Gaussian-shaped distributions. Otherwise, there's no way to for the partial pooling approach to work. So where the win is actually comes into these observations on this per topic level, where you can see at the top right of this graph, there's a predictive interval that's well away from where the data points are actually suggesting that it should be. So skew normal priors are better able to fit the data and more tightly. And so that, asks, that answers research question two. And finally, the, the third research question we're not able to, to show all of the data on this slide, but effectively what the Bayesian risk approach is, how it's different to the other frequentist approaches, is that it's more conservative in the inferences that it provides, purely based on the fact that it can only base these inferences on what is known about system uh, models 
rather than the entire hypothetical population of, of different scores. So in any case, there's no harm in combining these frequentist inferences with Bayesian inferences as well. Uh, in fact, they're, they're complementary, right? So the key takeaways from this presentation is by using Bayesian hierarchical models with system artifacts, you'll get inferences based on a set of known reference systems, which also corrects for multiple comparisons as part of the Bayesian hierarchical pooling process. Uh, the code is available for, for doing some of this stuff in your own research if you'd like. Uh, it's at GitHub. And thank you so much for watching.